Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me on this wonderful Wednesday night, seven o'clock session of Zoom into Wine. My name is Ian Blackburn. I'm a wine specialist in Los Angeles. I run a wine store called Merchant of Wine. And uh, every Wednesday night, we get together some great people to talk about fine wine. Tonight's topicality is just basically covering kind of a bunch of unique wines that I've got in the store that I think are really great, that they should be on your radar. They're really good values. They uh, drink, some of them are inexpensive wines that drink above their weight. Some of them are just really good at what they are, what they're doing. All right, so here's our slideshow for tonight. Top new values, and here we go. Wine number one uh, coming in from Entre de Mer. This is a really a, a volume laden area in the south part of Bordeaux, but this is a better house that's doing some really nice things. It's gotten a lot of attention from a lot of wine stores um, or in and around LA. We are all pretty excited about what's happening in this bottle of wine. Um, these vineyards are uh, a pretty fertile land. So this is flat lands for the most part, uh, a lot of tractor use, etc. But everything that this producer brings in, it's got a real sustainable, um, and I said producer, I meant uh, importer. This importer works with all wineries that try to be as sustainable and as um, not necessarily biodynamic, but uh, if they're not uh, European um, organic or sustainable or something. They've got these practices in place. So they can do a lot of things here um, with tractor. Um, harvesting grapes takes a lot of man hours and gets very expensive. So if you can pick with a harvester, with, uh, you can save a fortune. Um, and so th these, this, this fruit is harvested mechanically. And it comes from a wine that's made with Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. Those are the two of the three grape varieties. Anybody know the third grape variety that you can use in Bordeaux Blanc? Muscadel would be the name of that grape variety, often seen in, in blends, et cetera, but not, not, not common in the Entre de Mer. Entre de Mer usually focuses on Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. And, um, Here's our review, beautiful golden pale color, a fragrant and lively wine with rich aromatic intensity, notes of grapefruit, box wood, blackberry leaf. I guess you only know what that smells like if you've picked blackberries. And citrus jump from the glass. On the palate, the wine is round with flavors of dried fruits, almonds, and honey. Lovely crisp and dry white. It should be consumed young, pairs with poultry, shellfish, grilled fish, pastas, and cream sauces. This wine's 15 bucks and does discount. And everybody that's on the Zoom tonight, you've got a discount code where you get it on bottle one. But at our store at Merchant of Wine, 10% off anytime you assort 12 bottles, the discount. So um just check that out let's taste it together and see what you guys think so Tsuko's with us from japan my friend john is sitting next to me in the office hey john <laughs> we're gonna go uh go to it's comedy night tonight we're gonna go see a comedian and i think john thought i was taking him to see chris rock but we're gonna see chris tucker john chris tucker better. Uh, even better good So those aromatics are awesome, right? It's bright, lively, citrus, a little honey, like they said. Um, that's pretty damn complex for a little $14 bottle of wine. It's really uh, got nice alcohol, not too heavy. Good ethos, like I said, 13% alcohol to be exact. In the mouth, it's got a nice crisp, nothing too heavy, nothing too weighty, but um, I like it. Uh, I sell a lot of it and I plan to keep it in stock. 
uh, we take pretty big chunks of this wine to get the best price. And I think you look around and see our price, especially with that discount, it's probably the best price on the, on the planet or very close. So check that out. It's always fun to find a wine that you can get behind at $15. Don't have many, but I do uh, taste a lot to try to find some that makes sense. All right, well, I'm ready for wine number two. I'm gonna push this along tonight. Chris Tucker, waiting for us, Johnny. Natalie, how are you doing? I'm fabulous, Ian, thank you. Good. Are, 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 is there gonna be a heat wave in your area as well? Because about five days ago, we had nothing but like 60 and 70 degree temperatures on the 10 day forecast. This weekend, 100 degrees for about three days here in Los Angeles. Wow. Yeah. So our weekend was pretty warm too. I was actually uh, out catching some vitamin D uh, this weekend and it was October 1st. I couldn't believe it. So yeah. enjoyed that. But today, definitely cooler fall temps for sure. All right. Well, got to like, like a bear, you got to store it up for the winter, right? Yeah. Yeah. We <laughs> We have uber long winters here, so. <laughs> Very cool. I hope you guys enjoyed the first wine and it looked like uh, from the shaking of the heads, uh, good stuff, right? Hard to beat that one. All right, we're gonna go into wine number two. Um, I, have always liked this wine. I This is not the first vintage I've carried this wine, but someone maybe forgot to tell them to take a price increase because every Napa Sauvignon Blanc, I'm talking about famous Sauvignon Blancs. I'm not going to name names because they might get mad at me, but they all took huge price increases. And Pam Starr, former winemaker at Spotswood and her partner, uh, the Croc Mr. Crocker, grow grapes in San Helena. They do have a wine here that's called a white blend of Sauvignon Blanc. And they're I'm not sure what they're playing around with there, but uh, it is 100% Sauvignon Blanc. I think they're just blending clones and maybe not just using some of their estate because usually they make estate wines. But this is a 2022. It's just come into stock. It is a screaming deal for what it is. Uh, you know, Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc, it has a lot of character, a lot of quality. I've got a bunch of them on the website, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100, $125 a bottle and higher. I love them all. They're all great. Um, but, you know, uh, it's a special day when I get to open up a $100 Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and this one is around $30. So, I want to put that in context. Um, Pam Starr, she is the winemaking side. And Charlie Crocker is the grape grower. He says, I do the work and she's the artist. There's their property in San Helena. Beautiful vineyard. And they're a hardworking team. They don't make a lot of wine, but the wine that they make is really good. And I did just recently feature her Cab Franc in our Cab Franc review. And it was really well received because she's kind of an awesome winemaker. I think if she really worked at it, she could be like, you know, uh, Heidi Barrett, uh, Thomas Rivers Brown, a uh, Philippe Malka doing a bunch of different vineyards. But uh, she's got her own pocket there, her own brand that she's taking care of. And she lives uh, probably a pretty, pretty nice life. Check out this, the description here. Bright citrus aromas of lemon peel and tangerine are complemented by orange blossom and sweet pea. On the palate, uh, refreshing tangerine leads the way, accompanied by lemon, yuzu, and mandarin. I love that use of yuzu in the description because you can get, totally get it there. The balanced, bright, acidic, and creamy texture carries it through its lengthy finish. So refreshing, it begs for another sip. There it is, $28.95. Love the package, love the label. Love the nose, so like 
I think the nose is very elevated. I love that yuzu comment. It's also kind of unique. I mean, maybe some people don't like this. We're going to find out here in a second. And it, it's okay to push back and tell me, nah, maybe not. Let me know. What do you guys think? What do you think, Johnny? I love it. I think it's great. I like wines that are dry but exciting like this that have, I mean, this kind of just like takes your breath away with that nose. It's super dry, super cleansing. That 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 nose almost doesn't carry over to the mouth. That might be what some people might detract from it because the nose is so. Um, and that that's probably from some of the the clones of Sauvignon Blanc. There's a clone called Sauvignon Musquet, which I'm going to guarantee is in this wine because it it has this uh, super citrus note that just comes flying out of the glass plus she's making this um in a pr very protective way as a good winemaker would know how to really take that information and really you know put it get it into the bottle so um uh, cool fermentations and also the right amount of time and and other vessels and she does use different vessels here and incorporates it together so it really builds the wine together. $29. Um, that's a first for a Napa Sauvignon Blanc from the top producer. Really good. Excuse me, Ian. When you talk about different vessels, are you talking like stainless steel tanks and like yes? Yeah, so Johnny's asking me about the type of vessels. Yeah, stainless steel tank, wood barrel. Um I don't think she's using anything too outside the box, like, uh, but she might be using some concrete egg. Ooh. Have you ever seen those things? They don't have any edges. So the wine's in almost like perpetual motion and it's uh, pulling air through a thick concrete barrier. So micro oxygenation is occurring. Love the refreshing smack on the palate. Thanks, Natalie. I like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty nice and vocal wine. Let's move into wine number three. Um, this has been featured in uh, uh, one of our overviews of Baja wine. Um, and tonight we're going to have the new vintage, well, new to me. Um, I've had a pretty good chunk of the uh, last Nebbiolo from this producer, and it was beautiful. So when the supplier came to see me, he goes, I saw that you're out of stock on the Nebbiolo. You got to try the new one. It's probably the best they've ever made. I said, you know, I've got so many Nebbiolo from Italy. That was really good. Let me try it. And I'm like, all right, I got to have it again. Um, this is uh, Bodega Henri Lorton. Uh, Mr. Lorton's family. He's a Bordeaux producer. You might hear the name Lorton. Um, there's there's a lot of Lorton family working at the highest ends of the Bordeaux food chain. And one of his son needed a place to work, so he sent him to Baja. And um, after getting a little bit of experience and finding out that uh, he likes it in Baja, said, I want to settle down over here and get to work. You know, as the the Lorton representative of Baja, Mexico, and Nebbiolo in Baja is kind of been the grape. I mean, you could argue Tempranillo, but you could also argue Nebbiolo. There's there's some really good renditions, and uh, this is a a really cool uh, version of Nebbiolo. Of course, Nebbiolo is the grape that makes Barolo and Barbaresco in Piedmont, Italy. As we lean the glass over, we can see this one's got some better color than most Nebbiolos from, from there. And I'm sure it's a combination of Clément and the fact that the temperatures here in Baja, a little bit warmer than over in, um, in Piedmont on a day-to-day -day basis. Total hours are what really count there. Total sunlight hours, total hours of heat. 
and uh, there's indexes and scales for that. So you get a little bit ripe, riper conditions here. Not a lot. Baja is not California. Okay, this is much more in in line with like Spain and Italy, and that's why so many of those grape varieties are planted in Baja. There's a couple of people making some pretty good Cabernet, but it doesn't taste like Napa Valley Cabernet at all. So uh, this is a you know winery with a very educated winemaker and a a lot of passion, young guys, um, and they're bringing it. They got uh, a future to build. Look at those grapes. Those grapes look pretty damn healthy to me. Nebbiolo is the grape from an intense and deep purple color. This wine with balsamic aromas of rosemary, thyme, and fresh cherry is fermented at low temperatures to preserve the aromatic purity and expressiveness of the bouquet. Aged 14 months in French oak barrels, new French oak barrels, the palate shows elegant freshness, firm but round tannins, almost juicy. This dense and balanced wine has high aging uh, potential of 10 to 20 years. Okay, all that, and it's 38 bucks. If I were a California chef doing some pretty, you know, maybe like nouveau pastas, uh, playing around with some really cool ingredients, I would definitely <clears throat> lean into this wine. Uh, first of all, uh, Barolos really do require more age. And restaurants have a hard time buying Barolos with age. So I would grab, you know, a pasta like a pot. What is that? Uh, pasta. I'm going to mispronounce it. Something Pepe. Cacio Pepe, right? Is that it? Cacio Pepe. That's the pepper on the pasta with the cream sauce. Or maybe one of the great dishes I ever had was in Piedmont where this fantastic fresh made pasta dish came to the table with uh little bits and pieces of all kinds of things and little pieces of pancetta and an egg sitting on top of it egg yolk just barely i don't even know if it was i think it was raw egg yolk actually and you just tossed it with the, all these herbs and spices pieces of bacon and the egg yolk that pairs with this wine so amazingly well you lean right into that that bacon mm, i can taste it still i love the texture too yeah i i, I i'm a fan of this wine i think it's unique i think it's a uh, good value i think it's exciting with food and a lot of potential there. Teresa, how are you doing? So glad to see you. It's been a while. It has been a while, Ian. It's good to see you. That's the, and you're going to be a man about town, huh? Later. <laughs> you know, I, I will say uh, the last couple of months, business has been pretty soft. So I have taken advantage of that. And I have been going out a lot. I've been doing all kinds of fun stuff. I'm, I am not going to mope about how tough business has been. I might eventually, because I'm going to run out of money, but. <laughs> <laughs> Are you taking in concerts or? Concerts, baseball games, comedy clubs, um, big, you know, food things are happening, food events. I was at one on Saturday. Yeah, um, I think you were over in Pasadena. I thought I saw. Yeah, in Pasadena coming up this Friday. It's called Taste Pasadena. of Pasadena. Pasadena. Uh, I had Doheny nights last week. So it's been a lot. It's been a lot. In fact, every, you know, every week I go to the farmer's market uh, with my partner and we take a look and, at the calendar just before we get out of the car. What are we doing this week? How much can we buy? <laughs> We're not even cooking this week at all because we've got this night, this night, this night. Because usually you go to the farmer's market, you buy all this stuff, you bring it home. And then about a week later, you're throwing it all away. You're feeding it to the worms, right, Ian? <laughs> right. Feeding it to the worms. <laughs> well, have fun. Thank you. So I'd say I'd rather see uh, Roth than Tucker, but that's okay. 
<laughs> I've never seen uh, uh, Chris Tucker. And in my alternative universe, I, I come back as a, a uh, some sort of a comedian. I love comedy. Yeah. I used to work at the Ice House in Pasadena when I was a kid. Oh, wow. Yeah. And where is he playing? Where is he doing his show? Which venue? The YouTube theater. Big show. Oh, oh wow. Okay. It's being filmed, too. So I hope we get there and they let us sit. Exactly. Yeah. So let's move on to wine number four. I'm going to check in with Gary after we taste number four. Lo Fagaris. And I got to tell you how you know, the world just kind of lines up this way. I met the winemaker today in Los Angeles. She was here. Uh, I planned this tasting long ago. And I've, I've probably used this wine in a couple of, of moments throughout these Zooms. Because I, I even told her straight to her face, I do believe at, in this wine's somewhere around 40 bucks. I can't even remember. But I think that this is one of my favorite wines to recommend to people. Something that I really like, that I think is really good, regardless of price. You could drink it now. And it is so packed with values, with ethos, with history with everything terroir this is like man this thing is stamped with terroir marks on it the nose everything about it um so i'm going to move that slide and get some wine going here can you see my screen i hope i hear john humming over there he likes the smell Christopher Canaan purchased Clos Figaris in 1997 on the advice of René Barbier. Oh, man, René Barbier is like the king of Priorat. He is the winemaker of Clos Mogadar. And maybe it was too much money for René to afford it. René has his own brand that I also love. But he's the winemaker of Clos Mogador. And... Uh, Mr. Kadan did purchase this 10 hectare estate. Um, Carignan and Grenache are the grapes here. And uh, this wine here is about, uh, it's, it's Grenache, Syrah, Cabernet, Morved, and Carignan. And they make a number of different cuvées. What is really fascinating. If you ever get to go to Priorat, you'll, you're going to be warned to wear the right type of shoes because this soil looks like something out of, you know, a horror movie. Um, it has got this incredible rocky, jagged, rocky schist and just will tear up your feet. And so they, you know, kind of take their vineyard tours carefully. Um, it is basically the center of a volcano, a dormant volcano. And so it's got all these different rocks formations. And there was actually sea activity that came in as well. So it created this crazy strata of soil, soils. They, they call it licorata soils, but it looks like a lasagna. It's got clay, then schist, then limestone then granite, then, this, then more clay, then, and it's just like perfect layers. And for a winemaker, it's like, whoa, look at that soil. For a shoemaker, it's, a, it's, a, it's you know, probably a nice thing for a shoemaker. It keeps them busy. Um, so let's go into Clos Figaris. And the wine that we're drinking is their least expensive wine. Their top priorat is 150, 190, somewhere in there. It gets 96, 97, 98 points. It's remarkable. I love it. Um, I am out of stock on their top uh, Priorat at the moment, but more is coming. Um, but I sell, and, you, and the Priorat sells out. Like it's a small production. 
comes in, you get a minute to decide how much you want to buy. It's expensive. So you take a position, small, you have it, and then, the, you know, you sell it, you watch your, 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 how fast you sell it. And you maybe take a bigger position in the next year, or maybe the next year comes and you haven't sold what you got last year. So you just kind of, you know, play that game a little bit. Um, but with this wine, they keep a good amount in stock. Um, and uh, it was made by the owner's daughter. She grew up, went to wine school, went to work in the Rhone Valley, uh, worked for Gigal still uh, as a Rhone specialist, uh, working primarily with Cote Roti. And so she's quite active in her business. She helps with her father. And he said someday she, she's going to take over the place. And she says, well, let's get started now. Let me make a wine. And so she brought this wine to the estate. It's called Sierras del Priorat. And this is her addition to the lineup. Basically, it works out well because they do have younger vines. They keep their oldest vines for their high-end Priorat. They make a middle tier that's beautiful also. Um, and it, uh, it's called the well of the well. It uh, translates to the well of Clo Figaris. And then this is Sierras. Uh, Grenache, Carignan, Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah. I think I said more Ved too, but I don't think there's any in this one. But there is more, there is more Ved in the other wines. $34.95, $44 elsewhere. Um, also, they finish this wine now with a little wax. Everything they do here is um, natural winemaking, basically. Uh, very low sulfur usage in bottling. Um, natural fermentations. Uh, very, like, beyond sustainable. They're so concerned about protecting their terroir they're not using any chemicals in the vineyards it's dry farmed it's hand harvested those those hillsides you can get a tractor through there if you wanted to let's check it out on the nose you can really smell those those soils those aggressive soils like granite and schist really pass on some of that that interesting in the nose and then get a lot of the black pepper plum skin big mouthful of wine 14 and a half alcohol this is a warmer spot in Spain it's pretty plush and um, it's a very dependable wine too. Uh, vintage is not, vintages are pretty consistent there. A um, little more warm, a little more arid. A little, it's, by the way, it's about an hour and a half from Barcelona to this vineyard. So a real nice day trip from Barcelona, which is what we're going to be doing when we go to Spain next year. And I got to meet her today and she's like, I can't wait to see you in Spain. So we're going to see her on our trip to Spain. And so you know, check out that trip. It is posted now for November, mid-November next year. John, you and I went to Spain years ago. Remember that? That was pretty crazy. I'll write a book about that trip someday. <laughs> I need to go back with you. <laughs> All right. We'll pour the next one. We're moving right along, kind of no boundaries tonight. We've got uh, wines from all over the world. And tonight, uh, really a cool, cool wine. I kind of feel the same way about this one as the last one. This is a, a producer in Paso, 
And uh, I'm going to show a uh, higher end wine from Aaron uh, in our Paso tasting at a future date. Um, I'm really bullish about this brand. He worked for Saxum. He's worked in Australia. He's worked in Oregon. Um, this is really, he calls it his bootstrap project. I mean, he, he paid from paid for everything himself so not a lot of capital went in he's been building the business every year and um he is very well connected gets some great fruit and he's been taught to how to to do it well and really you know let the fruit do the work and to how to you know trust the fruit now paso is a really awesome wine growing area and you know, we drink most of it here in california so not everybody in the world gets to see many paso wines especially one like this because this is this guy's teeny teeny but um i got to meet him i got to taste with his wines uh, all of his wines i love everything he makes i carry his pinot noir which because of his location uh, San Luis Obispo Coast Appalachian, which just became an Appalachian within the last six months, is very nearby, and he puts an amazing spin on Pinot Noir. I, th I think I've used that recently in a Pinot Noir tasting uh, that we did. Uh, yes, I did. Um, he was on the Zoom with Matt Dees. I remember them having a nice conversation, and Matt Dees was very complimentary of his styling. Um, he does not own any vineyard he buys fruit uh again the bootstrap project there's a lot of growers up there but it's that's a, a you know a big big amount of time he doesn't have to to lay out um so he can make his wine and sell his wine and uh this is a simpler wine for him as other other wines have uh some fantastic accolades as well as some very powerful packaging simple on the packaging because he wants to keep this price nice and simple too you'll you'll be surprised at the price point 93 points wine enthusiast um petite syrah syrah grenache graciano let me just stop there for a second graciano that is a Rioja variety. What is Graciano doing here? Well, if you haven't heard this story before, there was a, a nursery that sold everybody in Paso Robles Morvedra. And everybody's growing their Morvedra, loving it. Man, this Morvedra is good. And a famous wine personality walked through the vineyard Spanish guy looks down. He goes, Morvedra. That is not Morvedra. That is Graciano. And they're like, huh? They all thought they had Morvedra. Everybody. They have Graciano. And everyone's like, damn, who would have thought? So it's a perfect thing because, you know, we don't need another GSM. So we make, you know, PSGG, Petit Syrah, Syrah, Grenache, Graciano. And that's what we've got here for 30 bucks. And uh, I, that color, yeah, you can see Petit, that's like super dense, dark, like almost like a neon purple. And that fruit, it has such a spectrum on it and you can smell some of those ripe tones little fig little prune little raisin little little plum skin uh that mouth is massively rich coating Luscious, hedonistic. Mm, pretty damn good.
Very cool. I'm glad you've heard that story, Natalie. Fun wine, don't you think? Yeah, great. Price point. Yeah, price, price per pound. That wine knocks it out of the park, you know. And if you're in the mood for a more terroir driven wine, you got the Priorat for a couple bucks more, or this one, they kind of are in the same category. This one is much more of that luscious fruit and layered. Uh, really good, really good. It will continue to go up in price. I mean, that's just the way things are. He's making this wine often with a lot of the leftovers from his higher end blends. So it gives him a way to move out stuff that he has to commit to, you know, fruit by the acre. But when he's blending other stuff, he can put it in here. And instead of bulking it out, losing money, he can put it in a bottle and keep some of that around and offer his wine club a pretty good deal. You won't find this wine many places. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly going to be uh, grabbing as much as I can from him on a regular basis. Um, I've showed this to a lot of people and people keep running back for more. So um, this would probably be the fourth or fifth time I've reordered this wine coming up very soon. Um, we're in 2021. I haven't seen the 2022 uh, release yet, but it might be might be out there. Moving into our next one. Are we already on wine number six? Wow, blowing through it. Feels good. Gary, how you doing? Got to get off mute. That's a good. Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> doing well. Very well, thank you. That Priorat just is great. The more it sits there and it opens up, it's just beautiful. Yeah, and honestly, you know, it's a it's a brand new wine, and time uh, is on your side with that wine. You don't have to hurry. That wine is uh, going to be there and continue to add some charm and stuff for five, ten, no problem. Um, so yeah. I, I really like that the way it evolves, and um, uh, maybe maybe we'll get to pre rot together, Gary. Hope so. I hope and so. I was trying to figure out the uh, aroma of the Keola, and, and I was hitting Syrah and then Grenache, and I said, "No, I'm not going to say anything stupid. I don't know which one it is." So I was glad to see they were both in there. Yeah, cool. Gary's a Gary's a successful graduate of our law school program, called Learn About Wine School, and uh, yeah, that's that's fun. The um, yeah, this wine and the Graciano too has a pretty big role in there too. It kind of really creates a really fun nose character, and I think that's why everybody really ended up liking it because it, it takes it right into the Paso lane. So uh, a lot of it out there. We're going to go into wine number six now to our Cabernet player tonight. Not often do you get to talk about Napa Valley and, uh, <clears throat> hold on, I'm losing it here. Yeah, I'm on the wrong show. There we go. Napa Valley being a value, but these guys uh, work really hard to put a good bottle of wine together. And uh, family said grandpa was either a genius or just the luckiest man around because they bought a huge chunk of Oakville back in the like 1920s, okay? 1920s. Um, so they, Oakville is, you know, right next, to, that's where Screaming Eagle comes from. And a lot of people pay a lot of money for the fruit. And Emerson Brown owns a big chunk of Oakville real estate and they do make oakville cabernet that they sell for a good amount of money they also make this napa cabernet which comes from their fruit and some others that they're farming young young lads here in the photo um hard-working guys the uh, family is 
almost all involved. And Keith Emerson, Emerson Brown Winery, is uh, in charge of the winemaking process. And this is a look at some of the vineyards. It's 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. Got 91 points from Robert Parker. I really like this style here for a wine of this price point. It's not trying to be a hundred, you know, taste like it's a hundred dollars. It's got a lot of charm. This is from a fire vintage, right? 2020. Um, there are some producers that will talk about how they picked early, how they got some fruit in. I I don't know who did or who didn't it's picking in, in time for the glass fires which happened in i think late august but a lot of people didn't even bother to make it 2020 and some people maybe this guy's with some of their own vineyards in play may or may not have had the insurance you know if you have fire insurance they won't let you pick the fruit you have to either take the claim and leave the fruit in the vineyard or pick it and make a run for it. <clears throat> so I'm not privy to all of that information, but um, I, when I tasted this wine and I assessed it, I didn't smell any kind of potential smoke taint. But you get really good that dusty cherry. Um, again, uh, stealing from the the review, kind of graphite. Um, it says chocolate covered blueberries, carrying into a palette that's signature blue and black fruits that emerge, supported by firm tannins. Tannins are one of the many acids in wine, and you know, are extracted during fermentation it's part of the color it's part of you know the seeds the stems everything about the the fruit and even the wood barrel add tannin to wine uh, so that's well integrated french oak provides another layer of like tahitian vanilla uh, with a rich rounded mouthfeel 4795 For a nice, authentic Napa Valley, small producer, does not say a state on here. So I'm going to guess that they took their fruit and the fruit of others here. Their high-end Oakville is an estate wine. And I like that it's just a, a really nice cab in the way it presents itself. It's balanced. Uh, price is nice. And um, I think it's a, a really good effort from what was a pretty tough, tough year. Um, and I, I think you know, being able to find Napa Valley Cabernets, uh, you know, there are at the $50 price point, there's a lot of very commercially successful big brands, but um, I'm, that's not the, really the business I'm in. I'm in more of the small brand, small family, small producer, uh, the farmer wines. And um, I really, I think this one's really good. I have to tell you on Sunday, I was helping a friend do her taxes and afterwards we were having light snacks and she likes cat, she likes red wine. So I went into my wines and got a Cabernet. We were drinking it at the end. She's like, that was really good. What was it? It was a pink peak 19. And all of a sudden went, we just sat there and drank a hundred dollar bottle of wine with no thought. <laughs> <laughs> just casually <laughs> with cheesy oh, crackers. <laughs> good for you. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, much I mean, I we're going to grab a Napa Valley Cabernet. It's probably a hundred dollars <laughs> or way more. Yeah. I, I'm, you know, as and I don't even know where I got it from. I, I don't know that that came from me, but maybe, 
we we do uh, every year have a little annual uh, friend raiser uh, for our Zoom products. The Zoom and the Wine package is going to be coming up uh, for renewal and as a gift included in the purchase and the renewal of your annual membership. We tend to promise a nice Napa Valley Cabernet, often valued over $100. And uh, we've sent out some really nice bottles of wine. And um, um, but, I think and, last year it was like a, a, the larger bottle. Well, everybody got something a little different. Oh, OK. All I know is it had a it had a wax top that was hard to get through. Yeah. But um, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the secret is to most of those? is you don't have to cut that wax. You just go right through it with your wine opener and don't and pretend it's not there. And when you go to pull the cork off, it just cracks right off the top. Well, since I, I live by myself, I was trying to use my, um, that thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it broke a couple of needles. It wasn't happy. Mm. Oh, damn, that's a really expensive bottle of wine then. <laughs> well, whatever it came with the free thing last year, that bigger <laughs> bottle, yeah. So what I do in that instance is I take the uh, the sharp knife of this type of wine opener and I carve out a little hole for my Corvin so that you don't try to go through that hard wax because, yeah, that that will break a Corvin needle for sure. I've done it. I, I do it all the time. It's And it sucks because those needles are like 40 bucks at least. Um, but... Uh, we, uh, we really enjoyed doing these programs. I hope you guys enjoyed tonight and uh, enjoyed the wines. Um, uh, did you like the Cabernet? Was it good? Good, good stuff, good. Um, and so we, we just tasted six really nice little uh, additions to the store. Some of them are reorders, some of them just kind of new, but um, uh, we continue to buy some really interesting stuff. The store now has over a thousand wines in it. And uh, we, uh, uh, I, I do have to tap out now because A, the store is packed. There's every time anything comes in and something's got to come out. Um, so the only time I can really buy wine now is when we run out of something. But uh, I am very proud of what we have in the store. And we're going to continue to do the Zooms and next week, the Italian tasting. I hope that you guys will join us because these are these are some of my favorite Italian wines. That's really what I'm doing now with the Zoom products. You know, when we first got started, it was like, who's available to Zoom? What wine can I use? Uh, I was just doing, you know, looking for solutions. Now I've got a store full of stuff that I get to go through and kind of pull these, these tastings together from our inventory and um, I sometimes buy a couple of wines to make the point in the Zoom, but uh, oftentimes it's going to be from things that we, we currently have, things that we currently support. Wineries also have gotten very busy and they don't like Zooming so much. So if I'm not supporting the wine already in the store, it's hard to get them on the Zooms also. Um, but we, we, I've been elevating the store for sure. There's really been a focus on finding just champions and that's all we've been bringing in um and so we'll we'll be here and i hope that uh you guys will continue to return and see us and uh you guys are some of our best supporters so thank you very much for being there for us and we hope to continue to be there with you and and uh, hope you continue to enjoy uh and i thank you all and uh mr chris tucker's calling so we'll say good night and uh we'll report back next week about how the comedy show goes <laughs> great have a great time Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Bye, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you, Sasuko. Thank you, Diane. Bye.